You were in for a real treat this morning, if I do say so myself. The first reading this morning is from Acts, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, which I happen to have studied in depth in my first year of theological education with a 1,000 word exegetical assignment, which I will now read for you page by page. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, I'm only joking. It is a blessed assignment and if my memory serves me correctly, I did do all right in the mark, but I'm not gonna tell you about that. So in my experience, it takes a little bit more than an academic essay or exegesis on paper to lead people into a place where they might consider being baptised or converted to Christian faith. In the experience of Philip in the passage which we've heard from in Acts, there must be more in play for this evangelism to be successful for the Ethiopian eunuch. And in fact, there are three things present in this text which I think we can learn from in our mission to evangelise and our um, aim to share the good news with other people, that there must be three things at least in play. The first is God's guidance and intervention. The second is a willing servant who will go and share the good news. And the third is a convert ripe for harvest. So God's guidance and intervention is the first essential element to successful faith experience that may lead someone to be converted and baptised. The author of Acts, attributed to be the same author as Luke, is presenting this conversion story as proof of God's presence with the followers of Jesus and intervention into their mission and destiny by way of procuring the perfect environmental setting for the eunuch to be baptised, the perfect context for Philip to be sent into, and the right timing and opportunity for the two to interact in such a way that this is a great success story. So firstly, we hear that a messenger of God, an angel, speaks directly to Philip and gives him extremely specific directions in where he needed to be geographically. The setting is a section of the ancient wilderness road in the direction of Gaza, and the specific spot Philip encounters the eunuch in his chariot is at the last watering stop before the desert on the way to Egypt. So this is important as often people would stop to water their animals and not go as fast at this point on the road as beyond this point they might be really focused on getting to their destination because wilderness roads in the ancient world were dangerous places. Not only were there wild animals that could come and start attacking the animals that were in a, in a um, procession, but there were also robbers on the road who would look for stragglers at the end of a group of people and also, there was the desert itself. If you ran out of supplies, you were in big trouble. So, that feeling I've kind of attributed to, if we combine it with, if anyone here has walked through a shady neighbourhood that you know has a little bit of crime and you're a bit worried about walking slowly, you want to walk fast. So you get that brisk kind of shuffle, getting through quickly. And mix that with the feeling that we might get if we are going bush, driving out where there's no phone reception, and perhaps we're not quite on that full tank of fuel, and watch it deplete slowly and slowly. So those two states of anxiety or panic, they could be alike what the ancient people would experience on the road beyond this point where Philip encounters the eunuch. So it's imperative that they meet up at this stage before the eunuch would not even consider talking to a stranger but would just be completely focused on reaching the destination safely. God set it up perfectly. Now the other good timing element is that the eunuch was reading from the prophet Isaiah while in his chariot just when Philip came along and was then able to converse with him about it. Now in the ancient world it was quite common for people to read aloud when they were reading from scripture or really from anything. A bit different to how we are now when we sit on the train and try not to look at anybody and we're really quiet and we don't share anything. Well, in those days they were quite willing to be open about what they were reading and so they would read it aloud. Now, on my first imagining, this chariot would have been probably going at an alarming pace because initially I imagined it to be one of the gold chariots with a horse in front of it, I like what the Romans rode around in and those who were going to war would often have very, very fast horses so that their chariot would go at an alarming pace. I thought maybe it might be difficult for Philip to run alongside and catch up to it on foot. However, with a little bit more exegesis, discovered that this was not a gilt 
chariot, like the war chariots going very fast. It was actually more like an open carriage and not pulled by a horse, but rather by oxen. And so although oxen are extremely strong creatures, they don't move very fast. <coughs> so there we go, able to run alongside the chariot and start engaging in conversation without being too out of, out of breath. Now it would also explain how the eunuch was able to read while he was driving. That is the assumption, of course, that he was driving. Perhaps being such an important court official and treasurer of a queen's household, he would have had servants with him. And that would make sense as to why he commanded the chariot to stop, not just commanding the oxen, but probably the couple of people at the oxen head who were leading it along at a walking pace. So the next act of God in this story is the fact that the eunuch was called to be baptised. This meant that they needed access to a fresh, natural water source. Now, people in those days didn't have great bundles of water carried around with them in their, their wine skins, often would also have water skins. But that wasn't the way that they did baptism in those days. It was full immersion, so they needed more water than what they were able to carry. So it's perfect then that God has set up this meeting for pretty much the last natural water source stop. Otherwise, had this conversation happened later on down the road, or if once Philip was invited into the chariot, it did go beyond this source, Perhaps they wouldn't have turned back and they might have had to wait until they reached the destination and then Philip's next mission would have been delayed and we would have missed this fantastic opportunity. So God is very good at providing for those who are willing to do ministry. And that brings us to the next really important element of a successful evangelism. A willing Christian who says yes to God for ministry and mission. Philip has been very blessed in that the angel was very clear and direct in what God was expecting and where he needed to go. But he could have still said no. And if he had said no, then this story would not have been part of our early church conversion accounts and would not have showed how the ancient world was opened up with this gospel sharing and that it was inclusive for all people, not just those <coughs> in Jerusalem. So God always presents the choice to accept faith and belief and the duty that comes with baptism to serve or to go on living outside of God's mission. And that is a choice that we as Christians must make again and again in our ministry. To say yes, to go on, to do the hard yards and stay faithful and to trust that God will enable our ministries and resource us how we need. Now the first yes might be a big one. This was the first conversion story of an individual in the New Testament. It's very significant. It certainly was not the last that Philip did either, as we hear that at the end of the passage, he was whisked away by the Holy Spirit as soon as the eunuch was baptised and goes on to minister from Azotus, also Ashod, to Caesarea, which would have taken years of travel, being away from family and support networks and relying on the hospitality of strangers who he was encountering and actually trying to convert on the way. Not an easy task. And that's a lot of saying yes to God again and again. Now lastly, the really important part of a conversion story is a convert, the person who is to be converted. And this person needs to be ripe for conversion. Now a person who is already seeking faith is much more likely to accept guidance and spiritual direction towards God than someone who has no interest in their faith or relationship with religion. That seems to be pretty obvious. The Ethiopian eunuch was a seeker. He was most likely a Jewish proselyte. He'd just been to worship and he was reading from the Jewish scriptures. A God-fearing Gentile who, because of his position as a eunuch, but also because of his secular career in the household of a foreign ruler, could not hope to become a true convert to Judaism based on the exclusivity of the strict ethnic and cultural laws of the religious order of the day but he was still yearning for connection with God and for relationship and for actually learning more about God. Now that he was reading from the prophet Isaiah is very important because Isaiah in another place did foretell of the inclusion of social outcasts like the eunuch. At the coming of the Messiah, this was one of the promised things. And the part of the passage which Philip overhears him reading was of course part of the song of the suffering servant referring to Jesus. So Philip is able to then reveal to him and teach him and instruct him, something that he had not had access to before. 
And this is all about the inclusivity of, of the gospel, which has really been a theme for us in our readings, even in Lent. We were learning about how God's gospel does not apply to one group of people, but to all people. And that was also important that he was Ethiopian, because in those days, Africa was considered to be the very ends of the ancient world. They didn't think it went too much further after that, so why bother traveling beyond it? So here we are, Philip is reaching the very ends of the earth to convert. This is spreading geographically the gospel and letting it leak out into all corners of the earth. So the author is also setting up this conversion for what follows this passage. Now you can read ahead in Acts and find out who is the next convert and why this conversion story needed to be a little bit out of the ordinary to get us ready for the next one. You might have an inkling of who it is. It's a very important person for the rest of our faith tradition. I'll leave it at that and see if any of you can give me the answer at another stage. So what we've learnt this morning I hope can really help us in our mission, in our mission to share the good news, but remember that God's guidance and intervention must be there first. We can't go where we're not sent. It just doesn't work that way. That we need to say yes, and the yes is not one that is done once you're baptised and that's it. It's one that you have to say again and again, and it does mean trusting that God will provide once we have said yes to mission. And lastly, that a willing and ripe convert might come along in our stead. And we need to keep our eyes open to recognise such a person so that we are able to be like Philip and fulfil that mission to share the good news and to share the joy as well, because the eunuch did go away rejoicing. And that's what this is all about. So perhaps we might be able to remember this Ethiopian eunuch whenever we are trying to be good stewards of the gospel and share the good news wherever we may be. In the name of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.